Linda Smith. Mm -hmm. I was born Linda Franklin. I was born in 1942 to uh, Dorothy Franklin and James Franklin in Baltimore, Maryland. I was born at home, which wasn't unusual at that time. I was uh, born on Saratoga Street, I don't know the address, in West Baltimore. Okay. Um, uh, Linda is my cousin. Uh, my father, Alvin Franklin, and her father, James, were brothers. Um, there was a huge age difference, you know, uh, but I guess that sort of goes in the Franklin family because my oldest brother, Kelvin, and I was a huge age difference. Um, coming up in the 50s and the 60s in inner city Baltimore, talk to me a little bit about the neighborhood. Okay, I lived on, I lived in the 400 block of Stricker Street in West Baltimore. I loved it there. It was a close-knit neighborhood. Um, when you were out in the street, you had to kind of be on your P's and Q's because at that time, whenever you did something that you, you wouldn't want your parents to know about, you were in trouble because the neighbors would tell they would discipline you or they would point their finger and let you know that they were going to tell, their parent, tell your parents. So uh, you, uh, it was just like a, just a very close knit family, a neighborhood family. Um, I just I just loved it down there because, well, I I had to sit on the front. We I, we had to play in front of the door. We had to be in the house before dark. We knew that uh, when the lights came on, you had to get in the house. Um, there were some kids who had kind of freedom in the neighborhood. They could go where they want. But I was raised by my grandmother. And even though she wasn't home, she left certain rules that I knew I needed to follow. I was one of the latchkey kids. I went to school uh, about four or five blocks away, and that time it was safe to do that. I came home with a key around my neck. Um, I had kind of a routine because we had a big house, and I was always afraid in that house by myself. I'd run in, get my lunch, look at one of the soaps, knew it was time to come back home, and then I would leave. I, don't, I can't remember what my brothers did because they never came home with me, so I, I guess they had another routine. I, have, I, am, I didn't, didn't say that before, but I have two brothers I was raised one, uh, with. One was a year old me, Carl Franklin, um, and Larry Franklin. They're both deceased now. Of course, I miss them very much. Absolutely. Okay, with that, um, tell me a little bit about Carl. I, you know, I was way too young. I didn't... Mm -hmm you know, really get a chance to know him or? Uh, Paul was a nice guy. He was a handsome guy. He was very uh, kind of mischievous. Uh, the neighbors loved him, but they knew that uh, you watch out because Paul might be <laughs> doing little sneaky things. Um, but, and, he, and school was not his favorite place, but the teachers, they loved him. Uh, they kind of, they kind of um, would say like, oh my God, Carl Franklin's going to be in my class. But they still had a certain uh, way that they kind of loved him. Mm -hmm. uh, when, I, when I went to elementary school behind him, almost every class I went in, they would say, oh, you're Carl's sister. And they thought that there was going to be a lot of mischief coming from me, but they, that never happened. I was like totally... Uh, dedicated to school and pretty good, pretty well behaved, talk too much, but that was about it. Okay. Yeah. Tell me about, um, you said you were raised by your grandmother. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me about her. What was her name? My grandmother's name was Pauline Franklin. Um, I really never knew her exact name. She used to tell me her name was Pauline Estelle Franklin. Sometimes she said Pauline Estelle Marion Franklin. I had to talk with my dad years later and he only knew about the Miriam. So things seem like they're things she used to tell me but they kind of changed around, you know. Uh, my grandmother was a domestic worker. Um, she went to work every day just about and worked in the, you know, the homes of the white people cleaned, ironed. Uh, Sometimes I'd see her, uh, she'd be very, she'd get up, she'd have a lot of pain at night from working hard, but the next morning she'd drag herself out, go to work, 
leave rules home. I knew what we were supposed to do. We also knew to look out that door. So we see her coming, we knew we had better have things straight in the house and better have ourselves in the house. Uh, she also took in uh, washed and ironed for people in the neighborhood. She uh, sometimes uh, cooked food and, uh, for neighbors and stuff. And she also did like, uh, back in the day, she used to can food and some stuff. She also uh, did something what they call stretching curtain. I don't know. She used to take curtains and put them on this wooden thing and stretch them and, uh, and fix them up for her, our house or the neighbors and stuff. She did a lot of, she was very handy stuff. She took in the ironing and we'd take the clothes even within the neighborhood, take the baskets of clothes to the people. Mm -hmm. um, she wasn't well educated. She, uh, I think she told me she went to about the fifth or sixth grade. But she was very smart and knowing how to uh, take care of business. She owned her own home we lived in. She had some property. They always told me our family had some property up on Route 40. In fact, um, there was a drive-in movie right up from Emerson Village somewhere. In Winter's Lane. Yeah, and uh -huh. that was part of the uh, property, so I heard. Yeah, know. to fill that in, it was at... Uh, they owned a farm. It was a pig farm. I mean, this comes from me doing all this research. Mm -hmm. um, it was right at the corner of what we now call Route 40 in Winters Lane. Uh, it was sold in 1943 or 44, something like that, for the sum of $4,000. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> if, if those of you from Baltimore... Uh, Know that area. It's where the uh, Circuit City used to be. It's a H. H. Gregg, and it's a Home Depot now. Yeah. So, whew, amazing. With that, um, my dad, uh, uh, he used to tell me about how they used to. It was dirt road from Winters Lane, all the way down to Hilton Street. The city didn't start until Hilton Street, and how you know that was such a big deal for them when they got a chance to come into the city. Um, Tell me a little bit what, if anything, you know about our grandfather. Um, I know I don't know very much about him. I know his name was uh, Jesse. They told me Jesse James Franklin, <laughs> which I always equated with the Jesse James. Uh, he's a very proud man. Uh, from the stories I got from my grandmother, <laughs> he was kind of like. A, a woman's, <laughs> or I guess a woman's man, uh, and he wasn't too great a family man uh, back in the day when he had his three children to raise. That was basically left to my grandmother. Mm -hmm. um, for years, I didn't know him. I just hear about him mm -hmm. <laughs> and wonder about this person that they talked about. My grandma's favorite saying was. When the, uh, people would say something, oh, she used to tell me that when he was asleep, they would say, uh, she would tell the kids, don't wake the devil up, let, us, let the devil sleep. <laughs> so that was the only thing, I, was one thing I definitely remember about him. But um, um, after a while, I was probably around 11 or 12, I heard he was coming to visit, and he came to the house and he started visiting, and my, and my grandmother started talking back and forth to him. And he... Eventually, I don't know what he said to her, but that's when she decided that she was going to uh, reunite with him. And I was 13. At that point, I was going to go back and live with my father. But I heard my grandmother talking to our Aunt Annie, and she was really upset that she had me since I was two, and that I was getting ready to go live with my dad. So I felt bad about that, and I told Dad, you know, I got to go, and that's how I ended up moving to Philly when I was 13. Okay. When I got to Philly, I found that he had a job, which was seemed like something that was kind of unusual for him. I think he did cook and do different things around, okay. you know, he had little kind of jobs like that. But there, in Philadelphia, he was a sanitation worker, and he loved that job. Uh, I think he worked on the west side of Philly or somewhere because he'd get up in the morning and he would go and he'd come back and talk about it and you would think he was the President of the United States doing some business over there and in fact he would come in our neighborhood and get his big broom and push that broom and think he was cleaning up the neighborhood and my 
sister-in-law and I used to be so embarrassed at him, thinking he was just, he had a real proud walk. Mm -hmm. That's basically what I remember about oh, man, that That's incredible. That's, that's more than I had. Uh, that's for sure. And I couldn't find much. Okay. Um, let's, let's talk about your dad a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, the stories I remember from my dad is that, um, that your dad was a pretty, really good athlete mm -hmm. when he was young. And uh, my dad used to always say that it was the hardest thing for him was living up mm -hmm. to, you know, what Jake had accomplished. So when he mm -hmm. would go through school, they expected him to play football like he played football and play yeah. basketball like he played basketball. Talk about Uncle Jake a little bit. Yeah, dad, dad was a ex excellent athlete. He was, um, I think he was a good student because he told me at one time that he had won, like, he had uh, won a scholarship. It was sports related, but he had good grades too. But he always regretted that he was never able to go to college uh, because he uh, had to help out with the family. Uh, he went to Douglas High School. Mm -hmm. um, he played, uh, baseball was his favorite. Mm -hmm. and he was an excellent baseball player. I don't remember, I don't remember what position he played. Okay. Uh, he played uh, a little football. Mm -hmm. He played, he was an excellent basketball player too. And as a matter of fact, after he graduated from high school, even though he didn't uh, go to college on the scholarship, he played with the, uh, the, the Negro, uh, Black Negro mm -hmm. League. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I heard that. Mm -hmm. What did they call, he told me the names of them and I can't think of them right now. The Elites or something. Uh, I have that written down somewhere. But yeah, the Baltimore know. Elites was the baseball team. It, it was yeah, baseball he played team. with them. It was mm -hmm. a traveling uh, mm -hmm. team that he played. Uh, with. I had one of their jerseys, actually. Yeah. In mm -hmm. fact, I uh, ended up buying him one uh, because he had talked about it. He was so proud when he got that. Mm -hmm. But uh, he was a very good. Then he, he started to work as uh, he worked in the started working in the post office when I was an infant, and he worked there until yeah. he retired. He worked downtown Baltimore in a big post office at night. Uh, he, yeah, I remember him telling me he, he, he had more awards than a lot of his bosses on the job because he was such a diligent worker. You know, I remember him, he had some little box where he had to learn all these schemes mm -hmm. and he used to work on those and get all kind of awards. He kind of, you kind of remind me of him with some of the things you like doing because Daddy would enter contests. I remember one time he heard of something on the radio, and he entered this radio contest, and I came, uh, came home one day, and he had won all these prizes, all kinds of things for uh, this contest he had entered. Uh, he also, um, I think, as he, for a, at a young age, he kind of rebelled, didn't go to church much or anything. Then uh, when he his second marriage, he got involved with in my mother's church, uh, United Methodist mm -hmm. Church in Baltimore, uh, and he was in every on every committee on every board. He was like the church almost. He, he was very dedicated. What I what I remember um, most about Uncle Jake is every Sunday, mm -hmm. you know, him coming by um, the house and. Uh, Always just looking so looking distinguished, sharp. <laughs> so distinguished, yeah. just had it together, you know what I mean? And uh, I remember telling uh, him and my, my Uncle Bud on my mom's side, they were the only two men I would ever see in a shirt and tie, hmm. you know? Yeah. And uh, it, it, just being able to see it was so incredible because it was my inspiration. At, at a very young age, I knew that where I grew up and what I saw, I don't know how, but I knew that's not what I wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't want to be that or live that yeah. way. Yeah. Um, but Uncle Jake, you know, I mean, just sharp. Yeah. Car always clean. That yeah. Chrysler, whatever it was, you know, just yeah. always clean. You know, and uh, I just, it was an inspiration. It really was, just from afar. I mean, he, we didn't have many conversations with him. Mm -hmm. He would come in and have conversations with my dad, and they always wanted to be alone, just mm -hmm. them two. And um, and then he would leave, but yeah. it was cool though. You know what I mean? That that was very cool. So okay, let's roll into. Let's talk about your mom a little bit, Aunt Dorothy. Hmm. Well, my mother um, always 
loved my mother, but I always loved her like from a from a distance mm -hmm. because I didn't have much. Uh, I didn't. I wasn't around her that often. Mm -hmm. uh, she was to me always a sharp lady, mm -hmm. and uh, she was always nice to me when I was around. But it was as a young child I found myself being the one that kept a relationship going because my mother was kind of into her life mm -hmm. and. Uh, my father raised us, mm -hmm. he and my grandmother. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get to see her that often. She'd come see us every now and then, but mostly I'd hunt her down. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, there were many times when I would just kind of go past her house and I could tell that it wasn't a good time or she didn't really want any company because she was doing her thing. Mm -hmm. But in time, um, our relationship grew. Mm -hmm. um, we never, to me had what I would call a mother-daughter relationship, the kind that you would have if your mother raised you, mm -hmm. but we always had a tight love for okay. each other. Um, and the one thing, she and my dad always had a pretty decent relationship, mm -hmm. even though they had been divorced for years. My dad would sometimes stop by and just, if you see her on the front steps, because you know, back in the day, <laughs> folks right. set out in front of the house. He just stopped there, and I always loved to see them just sit and talk, even though I knew he had his new life and she had hers, but uh, they always, you know, respected each other, and uh, in that way, that, was, that made me feel good. To swing back to your dad very quickly, I have this really big, or had this really big picture of when he and Aunt Horty mm -hmm. got married in the wedding party mm -hmm. and I see my brother Marvin there with this little tuxedo on he was just a, a little fella it just seemed to me like that was a that was one of those picture dates mm -hmm. do you remember that you well know? actually you kind of confusing something right now the picture uh, if you talk about their wedding Marvin wasn't there but if you saw him in the tux that was my wedding was it? Marvin okay. was the ring bearer at okay. my wedding. Okay. And uh, he was about, I was thinking about that last night, he was about seven or right. something yeah. like yeah. that. And okay. he had us on the full length tux. Yep, Th that's the picture yeah. then, that's what that I'm talking about. Right? I thought it was their wedding. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, everybody looks so great. Well, yeah. tell me about that because I love that picture. <laughs> well, uh, that I, got, I got married in uh, February 27th of 19. 1965 okay. uh, and Marvin was the ring bearer and that picture it is my mother-in-law my father-in-law and uh, I met their son at Cars Beach okay. mm -hmm. uh, and then my mom and dad was there uh, and I asked Marvin to be in it because it was I had to decide it was a lot of you five of you but he was like the perfect age to go with the uh, flower girl right. who was a student in my mother, my stepmother's class mm -hmm. and we had take my mother used to bring her, have her overnight and stuff back in the day you could bring, you know, mm -hmm. to, you could get your kids uh, from your class and bring them home. Mama had a great relationship with her since she was seven and Marvin was set about seven or eight. That's why he was at my wedding. Cool. Yeah, yeah so, that, that was, <laughs> that is such yeah. a great picture. Um, okay, let's uh, Talk a little bit about, um, let's talk about Aunt Alma a little bit. With, give me your recollections about Aunt Alma. Aunt Alma, Aunt Alma was like, uh, she was like the, she had the home where the family gathered most of the time. Uh, she and Uncle Robert, they had like the car when nobody else had a car. <laughs> they had a TV when nobody else had a television. Uh, Aunt Alma used to live uh, near your grand your grandmother, but it was Pierce Street down that area off of Mulberry yep. Street. Mm -hmm. And um, when we didn't have a television, once a week we used to go walking about five or six blocks from Stricker Street to her house so we could see like Milton Burrow mm -hmm. and the Ed Sullivan show and certain shows that we wanted to see mm -hmm. and, we'd, and we'd go there. Uh, and Alan also would take us on country Sundays, she'd take us on country rides and show us where their property was and to, and when I think about it they weren't taking us that far they were taking us like where Emerson Village might right. be now but back then we called it out in the country right. 
and they moved in several places. They had a home in the country, which I used to love going to their home. They always had, they always seemed to have a lot of people there and they always be cooking big meals and gathering together. And, uh, and Alma was a, I um, no, she was like a registered nurse mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she and Uncle Rob always had these businesses. Mm -hmm. They, of course, they worked down the beach right. and they had us the, the big business there. Uh, and Uncle Rye had some other, other kind of business ventures. They were people that like weren't that educated, but yet were very smart and mm -hmm. very, you know, able to uh, succeed because they knew how, they were go-getters. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Um, now, we're going to move to my dad. Okay. I know this, this should be complicated. Well, she'd be comical, not complicated, but <laughs> comical. Tell me recollections of my dad. Well, Alvin was always a lot of fun to be around. <laughs> uh, and it's funny because I thought of him as being like my older uncle. But it wasn't until I got to be like a young adult when he made it clear to me, I'm not all that much older than you. As a matter of fact, your mother... I thought she was like my older aunt, but she was only like about six years older than me, and I think Alan was about nine or ten. Yep, nine. Mm -hmm. Nine, yeah. But he was always fun to be around. He was all um, Mama's heart. Mm -hmm. She would fuss at him a lot, but he was definitely her heart. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how he got the name. I think he got that down the beach of being called Fat Daddy. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was another name he had too, I can't think of that. But he was just, and he, uh, he was, I thought he used to be so shy when he went into the service, came back and had his uniform on and whatever. Mm -hmm. But I remember back when he met uh, his wife, your mother, mm -hmm. they, she was living right up. Uh, aunt, your Aunt Minnie was living two doors up or three doors up the street from me and um, Alvin used to be going up to the house all the time and to this day I remember my grandmother saying, our grandmother saying, uh, you better go get Alvin. He up there in that house and they up there, go get him out of there. In fact, one day I remember I went up there and I tried to get him. Alvin and Peter May were like teenagers, but he was in there and my mom was looking for him and I tried to get him out of there. And I went upstairs in Minnie's apartment I said, Alvin, uh, I said, is Alvin here? Was a few little couples in there, you know, mm -hmm. and they were trying to tell me, no, he's not here. But I knew he was too, so I said to him, I said out loud, well, if he's here, he better be getting out because Mama's on her way up here with a broom. <laughs> I'll never forget that. <laughs> and things start scrambling, and I know they not found a way to get out of that house, though. But um, I just enjoyed Alvin. Uh, I could count on him for anything. He did a lot of nice things for me. To, uh, some things I didn't even ask Daddy. I'd ask him because I know it was something he'd get into, especially if somebody was annoying me or whatever. So. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. All right. Um, let's talk about the beach. Let's let's move it to the beach. Uh, Obviously, you know, my recollections of the beach are just from such a young kid's mm -hmm. perspective. You know, it was the end mm -hmm. by the time I could consciously know what was yeah. going on. But I do have some small memories. But uh, tell me. Tell me about well, the beach. Well, I, I, um, I started working down the beach when I was, I could say work. It was more or less planned. Going down with my aunt and uncle when I was probably in the second or third, definitely third grade. Uh, mm -hmm. but, they had all kind of little stands down at the beach. Uh, they had, I would be like picking up nickels. They had like where you could pitch nickels on uh, in the glasses. If you got a nickel in the glass, you won a prize. So I was able to pick, start off picking up the nickels. Then I started giving change to people, uh, all of us. And Alma made it like a family thing. And as you got older, she would pay you a little bit. So you thought, I called it. That's why I said I started working because she'd give you a little bit. And there were all kinds of stands. It started out, my aunt and uncle had about two stands down there. Mm -hmm. Then, the, But within a few years, they had, I know they had up to about eight stands. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed being down there because you got to see all the movie stars. I mean, all the big stars, and Motown stars and stuff. 
all of them came down a beach at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, there were two beaches, Cars Beach and Sparrows Beach, my aunt. And I also had a stand over there at Spar uh, Sparrows Beach. As a matter of fact, that's when I got to know Dion, um, Dion Warwick very well, because she'd come every Sunday. Okay. And she'd come over and we'd talk and stuff. Uh, I was down there when Frankie Lyman was down there, got his autograph. Uncle Rob knew I was crazy about it, brought him over to me when I was about 12 or 13. I almost passed out because I'm not one of the people that really like to, you know, know what to do when a star come by. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, we just loved it. I used to, as kids, we would work, but we'd all, and so did your father, we'd work, but we'd sneak away when the band played and, and be up there dancing. And, mm -hmm. Uh, it was just a great place to grow up. Right. Yeah. All right. So, let's bring the thing back around to you. What I remember um, when I was young was that you were just my uber pretty cousin. Just oh, wow. so gorgeous and so beautiful. Um, and I remember um, that you had gone to college, you know, oh. that you, so you were college educated. and. Um, I just always remember you coming to get Andrea. You know, mm -hmm. we would be at Mama's playing, mm -hmm. and you would just come in and you waltz in and you know, mm -hmm. kiss Mama or whatever, and then you'd get Andrea and leave. Um, talk about you growing up, high school, college. Um, I went to school in Baltimore till I was thirteen. Um, elementary school and we had a, a middle school which we called junior high. I happened to go to one that only had one grade in it. It was called Annex um, down on Saratoga and Curry Street. Yep. I was kind of scared to go there because prior to going they would tell you about how rough it was. But I really had no trouble. I loved it. And then I moved from there to Philadelphia. When I moved to Philadelphia it was like totally different because when I was in Baltimore Schools weren't integrated back then. And when I moved to Philadelphia, it was just like a whole new thing for me because even though I was in South Philly, uh, the schools were already integrated and uh, I hadn't seen anything like that. And I, you know, I really, that, that really uh, was different for me. But uh, in South Philly, wasn't, it was mostly black, but there, are, you know, there were other white kids, uh, Puerto Rican, whatever there. I love the schools there. I loved it there. Then I moved to, uh, went to high school where we were only 2% black. It was, I had to catch three buses to go. It was a wonderful school. I loved it. A lot of the kids I went to school with, I don't know if you heard of this bandstand. Mm -hmm. A lot of kids, because it was out of Philly, out of Philly yep. at the time. Mm -hmm. A lot of the kids went but of course only the white kids to go. The black kids couldn't go back. But I think just be, by the time I was getting ready to go to college, a few black kids at a time would go there. And even though our schools were integrated, and even though we had parties together and dances and stuff like that, we still had a situation where all the whites did their thing over here and all the black thing, did their thing over here. But I remember one day at a, a, a high school dance, some girlfriends of mine, your, your aunt by mm -hmm. and myself as a few of us, we decided we were tired of that, so we just went over and asked some of the black, uh, white kids to dance, and we started dancing, and the and next thing you know, everybody was dancing, really? and it was just the most amazing thing of how easy it was, and you know, even though in school we got along well, but you still did your own little thing, but I, I remember that, and I called myself I guess doing a little integrating thing there. <laughs> uh, but I went to John Bartram High School, which was a well-known school mm -hmm. there at the time. I always uh, keep in mind, I, I always tell people, and uh, I went to school during the time that Patty LaBelle was there. She was in my high school. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a year behind me. Uh, and I also went to school at the time when her husband was there. And then I went on to Cheney. Okay, yeah. And, uh, in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. It was a small black college that I loved. Mm -hmm. My first time really away from home, uh, I loved it. The college and, experience. Of course, came right out, taught school. Um, you know, came back to Baltimore, became a teacher, right. taught for 35 years. Okay. And what were the, the ages that you taught? What I actually taught, 
I'm one of those rare teachers that stayed in the same grade. I taught the first grade for the whole 35 years. Really? I taught summer school and I would teach from first, any grade from first to fifth. Mm -hmm. But uh, in um, regular school, I only taught the first grade. Mm -hmm. Sort of like my, my mother, my stepmother, mm -hmm. who was also a teacher, right. and almost all her family were teachers. Uh, she taught second grade. I don't know if you knew that your aunt Hortense taught second grade for 34 years. Yeah, I knew she was in the school system, mm -hmm. didn't know what she did though. Yeah. All right. So, okay, let's, let's parlay to that. Teaching first graders, mm -hmm. 34, 35 years of that, what did it teach you? Well, it's, it, it taught me, first of all, I didn't realize that children could learn so much. If you, if you presented them with it, they could, they could really learn a lot. Um, I saw changes, things changed a lot um, over those 35 years. When I first started teaching, it was a lot easier. <laughs> the discipline was a lot easier because kids had learned uh, that nobody, I mean it wasn't a perfect situation, but the kids were really just they looked up to the teachers, they weren't going to do but so much in front of their teachers and the parents were a lot more cooperative than it turned out in my last few years. That was the hardest part, uh, the discipline. Mm -hmm. And also uh, communicating with parents changed a lot mm -hmm. over the years. What do you attribute that to? Do you attribute it to... Um... I think the fact, to me, when they took prayer, uh, prayer out of school and when they kept, uh, you know, they took a lot out of the teachers and the administrators' hands. And uh, things just changed a lot to me then. Yeah. I remember getting my hands slapped. I remember yeah. getting paddled. I remember having to stand in the corner. Yeah. I, yeah, all that's gone. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, now, tell me, tell me about your children. Tell me about your grandchildren. Let's, <laughs> let's move on. Let's... Well, I have one daughter, of course. So I have... Uh, I have one daughter, who, Andrea Smith, who's 44 years old. Uh, we're close, <laughs> mm -hmm. but we have our back, you know, mm -hmm. mothers and daughter kind of things going on. She has one daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, we've always, she, well, I'll say this, she attended uh, Bowie State, and before then, she went to Norfolk, which you, um, you know yeah, that because right. you, right. <laughs> you were a transportation a lot. Uh, Norfolk, I don't think she really ever adjusted to that because uh, she's kind of like me, kind of a homebody. Uh, she didn't like it in Norfolk too much. She, was, uh, she adjusted much better at uh, Bowie because then she, could, she stayed on campus. Kind of stayed to herself a lot from what I know, but you know, you never know it all. <laughs> I say from what I know. Uh, she, uh, then she started, when she started driving, she'd commute um, and come on once a week. Mm -hmm. But we've always been pretty close. Uh, she had her own apartment for a while, then after a while, we decided to buy this house together. Mm -hmm. And that's worked out pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. So. In contrast to the, the relationship that you had with your mother, do you mm -hmm. think that contributed why you are so close to her? Oh, I'm sure it had a lot to do with it because mm -hmm. I always said that I, I will never, my daughter is never going to be but so far away from me, right. you know. Right. Uh, even though any parent and daughter, they may have, uh, sometimes I fuss at her because I tell her she's not... Uh, I like being hugged and whatever, and she's more like her dad, so she ain't gonna hug you or touch you or so much, but I know the love is there. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure she knows that I would not, she never will be but so far from me if I have anything to do with it, because she's really my heart and soul, and so is the one upstairs, my mm -hmm. granddaughter. Talk about it. And they are very much, they're so much like each other. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my granddaughter is, Smart. She loves school. She's mouthy. Mm -hmm. Her mother was mouthy, mm -hmm. but both of them have uh, the trait that they were. The mouth part was there, but they are very um, respectful and very nice people. And people that you know are gonna pretty much do what you say, even though 
my granddaughter tell you, I'm not doing that, Grandma. And give her a few <laughs> minutes, it's going to get done, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, my granddaughter loves school. She's a uh, very good student. Mm -hmm. She will get her homework done, and she might do her other thing, but that's most important to her. Mm -hmm. so. so, now, this is the thing that I think uh, most of the people that I interview have the hardest time with. But for me, I find it easy. Speak to Maya's children and Maya's children's children. What I think. What they should know. What, you know, what, what would you say to them? You know, when they look back so that like how we can only step back to our grandparents. Mm -hmm. and we don't know much. Mm -hmm. Let's let our great great grandparents, you know, it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. What would you say to them so that they know that we can pass out? Our knowledge. My, I guess my biggest thing is that I think heritage being stolen from black people in general mm -hmm. is the greatest crime that happened about bringing us here to America. We, a lot of people don't know the stock that we come from. Mm -hmm. I have a niece right now, Marvin's oldest daughter, who's stationed in upstate Pennsylvania. And she was on Facebook and she was writing how hard it is. She's in the army mm -hmm. and how hard it is. And I had to remind her, your grandfather was stationed up there in the army and he went through those same things. Uh -huh. And she was like, I knew it, but I wasn't thinking about it. Uh -huh. You can make it. You'll be okay. You come from good stock. Uh -huh. And that's the kind of thing I'm saying you would say. What would you say? Well, I would tell, him, I would tell her that uh, no matter what she has to face, to not give up, to give it her best. Um, I would tell her to lean on your faith. Uh, you can't, to, as far as I'm concerned, you can't make it without faith, without believing that in yourself and believing that you can make it. There are a lot of crazy things going to go around, go on around you, but you can, you can uh, make it if you try. You can try to help other people along the way. But you can, and not to let other people try to influence her how to live her life and what to do. I want her to think for herself and I hope not do what the crowd says. Mm -hmm. To do what's in your mind because you really know the right thing to do.